I don't know if uh, you were in the sanctuary when the, uh, the video was played, but I love what the actress playing the nurse in it said. Um, she said, the cross reminds us that the most terrible of days, the most difficult of times, can be redeemed in the hands of a loving God, a, a God who would not stop at anything, sacrifice everything to make all things new and good. Why is it Good Friday? It's good because God made it good, and I would add, it's good because of what it accomplished. Uh, I want to welcome you officially um, to Midtown's Good Friday gathering. My name is Norm. If I haven't met you and if you've never been here before, on behalf of the people of Midtown Church, I, I want to just let you know how great an honor and a privilege it is for us to have you with us this morning. And my hope and my prayer is that you come back on Sunday as well. I think today's uh, message that I'm going to share for a few minutes with you is the most Easter Sunday-like Good Friday message I've ever given. And although I don't apologize for that, the reason why is because we've been spending the last six weeks in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, which is the Bible's deepest dive into the resurrection of Jesus. And one of the things that we've seen, especially over the last two Sundays, is that if Jesus was raised physically from the dead, then those who have come to faith in Jesus will be raised physically too. We are going to be celebrating that on Sunday, and yet on this Good Friday, we're going to carry on with the discussion. And so if you have a Bible, take it out, turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. We're looking at verses 35 to 49 today. If you don't have a Bible, there are some uh, in the pew fronts or the pew backs in front of you. You can find the book of 1 Corinthians, again, chapter 15. We're looking at, a verse, at verses 35 to 40, 49. Uh, let me read, getting things kicked off by reading verse 35. Paul writes, but someone will ask, how are the dead raised? With what kind of body do they come? Just stop there. I, I love the questions. There's two questions in verse 35. How are the dead raised and what kind of bodies will they have? I, I'm not surprised by the questions because I think we have questions about our resurrection bodies like this. Um, but what surprises me, even though the questions don't surprise me, is Paul's initial response in the next verse. Take a look at verse 36. He begins by saying, you foolish person. What's that all about? I mean, don't we all have questions about something that we don't know much of? I mean, we get hints and glimpses as we will see in our text, but there are a lot of questions surrounding the resurrection of our bodies. So why does Paul come out like this? Why does he respond this way? Well, there's a couple of possible reasons why. One is because they are questions that he has heard before, perhaps from this same group. He spent a year and a half with this church when he planted it. But also tied into this, I think they weren't being asked for answer's sake. I think they were being asked, like many ask questions about the resurrection today, for mockery's sake. I, I think they were questions being asked by people who were wise in their own eyes, but were only displaying their folly. I mean, come on, Paul, the resurrection of the body. How can a body that's buried and goes into the ground and is decomposed there be resurrected? What if it's burnt? What then? What if it dies at sea and it drops down into the ocean and it, it's eaten up by fish and sharks? What, what then? Or it gets blown up and is nothing but dust in the wind? What what then? So maybe that's one of the reason why, reasons why Paul says, you foolish person. But a second reason I believe Paul responds this way is because all they had to do was look around to understand, to some degree at least, how the resurrection of the dead worked. If you believe in God, and if you believe God is creator, then God reveals in part at least how the resurrection of the dead takes place. So after this quick rebuke in verse 36, Paul explains how and why by use of three metaphors. Metaphor number one is seen in verses 36 to 38. Let me read those verses. You foolish person, what you sow does not come to life unless it dies. And what you sow is not the body that 
is to be, but a bare kernel, perhaps of wheat or of some other grain. But God gives it a body as he has chosen and to each kind of seed its own body. Now, what is Paul doing here? Well, he's speaking to a primarily agrarian people group. And what he is doing with this readership is he is likening the resurrection to what happens when a seed is put into the, into the ground. What happens? Well, it dies. Literally, what happens is it disintegrates and it, and it must. For a, if it doesn't die and it doesn't disintegrate, then what's contained in the seed won't burst forth. Jesus spoke to this kind of idea when he said in John 12, verse 24, truly, truly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. Now, in context with John 12 and the words of Jesus there, Jesus is speaking of his death and the fruit that he's talking about are his followers thereafter. But going to our text, in like sense, when, when we die, we each produce a fruit that is our resurrected body. But just notice verse 36 one more time. Put your eyes back into that verse, second part of it, where Paul writes, what you sow does not come to life unless it dies. Do you hear that? He, he's saying that when we die, it's not all over. But at that moment, and he adds to it, but at that moment, we enter life that is truly life. It's as if Paul is saying, we haven't truly lived yet. But tied to this, when a seed is buried in the ground, what comes out, although directly related to the seed, is different, and it's far different than the seed that preceded it. Take a look at verse 37. That's what Paul says there. And what you sow, so the body going into the ground, what you sow is not the body that is to be, but a bare kernel perhaps of wheat or of some other grain. Uh, this is called germination. Some of, you know, some of you know this term, your farmers, your gardeners. And it's nothing short of miraculous. When a seed goes into the ground, what it produces thereafter is nothing, again, short of miraculous. But instead of talking about it, why don't, why don't I show you what I mean by having a video played for us?
let, let me read verse 37 one more time. And what you sow is not the body that is to be, but a bare kernel, perhaps of wheat or of some other grain. Do you get the imagery? Do you, do you, do you understand the metaphor of what Paul is saying? See, when we go into the ground, what comes out is nothing like what has gone into the ground. And if God does something like that with a seed, what more can he do with us? So that's the first metaphor. But the second metaphor, which is found in verse 39, takes us, moves us from underground to life above it. Take a look at verse 39. Paul writes, For not all flesh is the same, but there is one kind for humans, another for animals, another for birds, and another for fish. So what is Paul's point here? Well, Paul's point here is, why would you doubt that God could give men and women resurrected bodies when all you have to do is look around to see how God has filled the planet with a huge array of living beings to demonstrate his power and his limitlessness? This verse flows out of verse 38 and shows us that in the same way there is great diversity in the plant world, so too is there great diversity in the animal kingdom. As Paul writes in verses 38 and 39, God gives as he has chosen, for not all flesh is the same. How many varieties of beings does Paul bring up in verse 39? Well, he talks about four, highlights four there, talks about humans, animals, birds, and fish. But then you have, have the many varieties and shapes and colors of each, right? How many? Well, thousands, literally tens of thousands, but you're not even done yet. Um, let me take you back to high school science. And if you're in high school science right now, I'm going to ruin your Friday. So let me take you back, all of us, back to high school science and remind you of some things that we learned there. In high school science, we learned that amino acids, if we were listening, amino acids are the basic building blocks of the human body. With a large proportion of our cells and our muscles and, and our tissue made up of, up of them. Listen to the following from an online amino acid website. Didn't know that even exists, but they're out there. We read this, I read this or read this there. When, when cells need protein, they follow instructions from DNA that define the specific amino acids and the and the order in which they must connect the, and build, connect to and build the protein. How many possible amino acid combinations are there? Well, in my prep, I discovered that there are about 600 octodecillion different combinations of amino acids. Now, what does that mean? What's an octodecillion? Well, an octodecillion is the number one followed by 57 zeros. There are 600 octodecillion different possible amino acid combinations. What does that tell us? Well, what we know is that not only does each type of plant or animal or human have a distinct grouping of amino acids, but each individual plant or animal or human has a unique grouping of them. There are no two blades of grass or flower, or animal, or human being, even identical twins that are exactly alike. Let me repeat that again. There are new, no two blades of, of grass on planet Earth that are exactly, exactly alike, yet each is completely identified with its own species or kind. I mean, how vast and immeasurable is our God? But some will say, I know, no, this is just a demonstration of the power and wonder of, of evolution. But in fact, it's at this point where the evolutionary theory breaks down in the most important and dramatic of ways. I, I quote again, no matter what we may eat, no matter how specialized or unbalanced our diet may be, and no matter what our environment may be, we will never change into a, another form of life. We may become healthier or more sickly, heavier or lighter, but we will never be anything but a human being and never any human being other than the one we are. The biological codes are binding and unique. There is no repeatable or 
demonstrable scientific proof that one form of life has changed or could change into another. In other words, no matter how much chicken I eat, I'll never sprout wings. And even if I climbed a tree and I sat on a branch for a million years, really wishing for wings, the whole time they'll never come. The biological codes don't allow for it. So that's metaphor number two. Metaphor number one was in the ground. Metaphor number two, species above the ground or in the water. Metaphor number three takes us to the heavenlies. Take a look at verses 40 and 41. There are heavenly bodies and earthly bodies. But the glory of the heavenly is of one kind and the glory of the earthly is of another. There there is one glory of the sun and another glory of the moon and another glory of the stars for star differs from star in glory. Okay, what's going on here? Well, people disagree with what Paul is meaning in these two verses. Some say he's simply giving another example of God's creativity and handiwork that in the same way there are are many varieties of animals and plants, etc., that there too is a great variety, forms, manifestations, glory, the uh, word Paul uses. There's many variations of planets and moons and stars and so forth. So maybe, maybe that's what he's talking about. Is that true? Certainly that's true, but I think there's more here. What, What Paul is saying, to borrow from one author, is that our resurrection bodies will differ from earthly bodies just as radically as the heavenly bodies, stars, moons, planets, and so forth, differ from what we see here. And and I like that. For however glorious and wonderful things are here, there is a certain glory that almost overwhelms us when we look to the sky, isn't there? I mean, there's a big difference between watching the sunset and watching me set. You know what I mean? Like if you go down to English Bay, summer, evening, watch the sunset, you watch that and you marvel at it. It's beautiful. I mean, you just, it's transcendent. But if I came down there and I said, watch me go into the ocean, right? It wouldn't move you. There's something, it's a terrible illustration, but you get the point. And the point is, if God, I mean, Midtown, if God has encircled the luminaries, the celestial places with indescribable glory, and he has, will he not be able to clothe human beings with transformed bodies? Oh, you foolish person. Just look around you. As I said, if you believe God is creator, then look around you. Look to the heavens. Look, look to the North Shore mountains. Look, look at what God has done and be convinced. Be assured of what he can do. Listen to this from Daniel chapter 12, verse 3. You can read it on the screen behind me. We read, and those who are wise shall shine like the brightness of the sky above. And those who turn many to righteousness, like the stars forever and ever. Listen to the words from Jesus in Matthew 13, 43. Then the righteous will shine like the sun in the kingdom of their father. He who has ears, let him hear. I I think John Newton had it right when he wrote, when we've been there 10,000 years, you know how the song goes, bright, shining like the sun, then... We've no less days to sing God's praise than when we first begun. Listen to how Paul, go back to our text, verse 42. Listen to how he starts, verse 42. So is it with the resurrection of the body. This is a summary statement. This points us back to the seed metaphor. It points us back to the animal metaphor. It points us to the heavenly metaphors. And he says, this is what's going to happen to our bodies if you are in Christ. So that's how and that's what. The two questions that were posed in our first verse, that's how and what. But Paul's not done yet. With the metaphors out of the way, he moves on to describing some of the specifics of our resurrected body. Notice what he says in verse 42, the second part. It is sown perishable, 
but it is raised imperishable. Bo- bodies break down and they deteriorate. Hate to break it to you, but they do. We can try to slow the process. We can eat well, we can exercise. That has some benefit to the here and now, but at the end of the day, in spite of doing all we can, our bodies will waste away. Even the greatest of athletes have to retire. Uh, Le- LeBron James, some of you know who LeBron James is. He just took over the, the, uh, p- the point record in the NBA, passing Kareem. He, he's been playing for about 20 years. He's an anomaly. He's a, he's a phenom. Um, he, he has said publicly that he spends about a million dollars a year on his body, um, which makes financial sense because he gets paid about 40 million a year, so it's a good investment. So a million, spend a million, make 40, makes sense, especially if you can prolong four or five years of that $40 million of salary. Why not spend a million dollars on your body? But here's the thing, he's got to retire too. A million dollars a year. He's going to retire because his body, his body is perishable, like all of ours are. Our resurrected bodies, in contrast, will be raised imperishable, undefiled, and never fading. Secondly, what Paul says in verse 43 is that our bodies are sown in dishonor, but they are raised in glory. What the Bible teaches is that we are conceived in sin, and right out of our mother's womb, we are committed to rebelling, resisting God in his ways. But a day is coming. A day is coming where our bodies will not wage war, where our desires won't be conflicted, where there will be no internal battles at all, where our bodies will be used only for pleasing, praising, enjoying, and glorifying the creator who made them. The third thing that Paul says about our bodies in verse 43 this time as well is that it is sown in weakness, it is raised in power. Our our bodies grow physically weaker. Uh, The disciples fell asleep in the garden, as you know, because even though their spirit was willing, their flesh was weak. But our bodies, our resurrected bodies, will be raised in great power. Next, what we discover about our bodies, if you look in verse 44, is Paul writes there, it is sown a natural body, it is raised a spiritual body. If there is a natural body, there is also a spiritual body. This is a summary verse of of sorts. Paul isn't saying that our resurrected bodies won't be physical, but that they will be suitable for the kingdom to come. Our bodies won't be immaterial, but will assume a different dimension as Paul writes in 2 Corinthians 5. They will be further clothed. As one writer puts it, they will be completely spirit-filled and completely spirit-governed. Praise God, man. We will all be lifted up, those in Christ, to a supernatural level. And who will deliver us from this body of death? Well, thanks be to God through Jesus Christ, our Lord. With the metaphors out of the way and these descriptions, further descriptions out of the way, Paul ends by focusing on Jesus, the first fruit himself. Take a look at verses 44 to 49. We'll end with this, these verses. It is sown a natural body, it is raised a spiritual body. If there is a natural body, there is also a spiritual body. Thus it is written, the first man, Adam, became a living being. The last Adam became a life-giving spirit. But it is not the spiritual that is first, but the natural and then the spiritual. The first man was from the earth, a man of dust. The second man is from heaven. As was the man of dust, so also are those who are of the dust. And as is the man of heaven, so also are those who are of heaven. Just as we have borne the image of the man of dust, we shall also bear the image of the man of heaven. Lot there, let me just sum up these verses this way. From Adam, we inherited our perishable, dishonoring, weak, and natural bodies, whose end is death. But from Jesus, the second Adam, the greater Adam, We inherit our imperishable, glorifying, powerful, and spiritual bodies whose end is eternal life. John writes this, you can notice it on the screen behind me in 1 John chapter 3 verse 2. Beloved, we are God's children now and what we will be has not yet appeared, 
but we know that when he appears, we shall be like him because we shall see him as he is. Paul puts it this way in Philippians 3, our citizenship is in heaven and from it we await a savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body to be like his glorious body by the power that enables him even to subject all things to himself. Now I took time, if you were here uh, earlier in this series, I took some time a couple of Sundays ago to highlight some of the things that we see in Jesus' glorified body, so I won't do that again today, but I will sum it up by saying that Jesus' body was remarkably the same, his resurrected body, but remarkably different too. And I think it's safe to say that ours will be the same. But I know how much we like to speculate, right? What will it be like though? Can't we have fun with this? Let's speculate. Can't we know some things about our bodies now? It's kind of fun to dream and imagine. I mean, are we all gonna be 21 years old? Like is heaven just full of 21 year olds? Right, 3% body fat. Hair where only hair belongs, right? You know what I mean? Like why is that growing there? It's a strange thing. We will, will, be, will we be able to all, like every woman will sing like Adele, right? Every man like Bocelli, you know, that's what'll be the choir in heaven. I don't know, I, I, I'm not sure. But I do wonder, I do wonder how much our society's view of beauty has influenced our view of how it should be in the kingdom to come. In Isaiah 53, which was the text that was read by Robin and Alicia, in Isaiah 53, it says that Jesus had no form or majesty that we should look at him, and yet when he rose, he looked the same. And yet, I have no doubt that when we see him face to face, his glory will be beyond description. And although you and I don't know exactly and fully what our res resurrection bodies will be like, we do know that we will be like him, as we read, clothed in righteousness, adorned with godliness, and filled with the imperishable beauty of the heart. So we know some things, but I think it's dangerous to speculate. Besides, and this is for those of you who only connect beauty and vibrancy with youth, what if all things negative connected to aging were removed? What if we did grow older without growing weaker? Wiser without losing our memory? Stronger without ever going backwards? Forever? What if that baby you lost will be a baby you grow with? Who knows? Speculation can be fun, but I have a suspicion that it will be abundantly and exceedingly beyond what we could ever think or imagine. What I do know, even though there's some mystery, however, to all of this, as we move to respond, is that in the age to come, there will be scars there. At least for one. You see, it was the resurrected Jesus who said to Thomas, put your finger here. Put your hand and place it in my side. When John, the writer of the book of Revelation, when he got a glimpse into heaven, he saw a lamb standing as if it had been slain. And if Jesus, in his resurrected state, still bore the nail marks in his hands and wound in his side, wouldn't he still bear the thorn marks in his head and the lashes on his back? Maybe. But it's my guess that when we see those scars, we will declare that, <clears throat> that we have never seen anything as beautiful as they. The beautiful and glorious scars of Jesus forever 
eternally scarred for us. It's by his stripes on his back that we are healed. And it's here, as I close, where this Easter Sunday-like message takes us to Good Friday. The day when Jesus received those wounds that would become his scars by being killed on a cross for our sins and placed into a grave so that we who come to faith and belief in Jesus give our lives to Jesus, repent of our sins that Jesus paid for, will one day be raised imperishable, glorious, powerful and heavenly as he was raised on Sunday morning. And that, Midtown, that's which is which truly makes Friday so good. Let me pray. Heavenly Father, we remember today the pain and suffering of the cross and all that your only begotten son, Jesus, was willing to endure so we could be set free. Lord Jesus, you paid the price, such a great sacrifice, securing for us the gift of eternal life. Help us never to take for granted this huge gift of love and the payment of death of our sin on our behalf. You bore our sins on the tree. Help us to be reminded of the cost of it all. Forgive us for being too busy or distracted by other things, for not fully recognizing what you freely gave, what you have done for us. But Lord Jesus, it wasn't only payment and love displayed on the cross, but your glory and the glory of your Father. For we now know God not only as our Creator, but as our Redeemer. Oh, the wisdom of God. Jesus, you were willing to be bruised on the heel for us, but in so doing, you crushed our enemy's head. Thank you, Lord Jesus, that by your wounds we are healed. Thank you that because of your death, we can live free. Thank you that sin and death have been conquered and that your power is everlasting. Thank you that we can say with great hope, it is finished. For we know the end of the story and death has lost its sting. And thank you, Lord Jesus, for the great promise that we who have been united with you in a death like yours will certainly also be united with you in a resurrection like yours. We praise you, for you are making all things new. And in the meantime, may we be people who experience more and more here and now the power that raised you, Jesus, from the dead. It's in the name of Jesus our Lord, our Savior and conquering King that we pray. Amen.